Um, okay. So, um, Paul, be ready with your, your, your comment, uh, remark about statistics, because we're going to be doing some statistics here. Uh, Chuck Schaefer of Seacoast uh, Bank, he joined Seacoast in 1997, appointed president, chief executive officer, and director of the company, the bank, and he's named chairman of the board in February 2022. He's going to talk to us about um, industry statistics and give us an economic update. And Paul, what do we know about statistics? 93% That's right. Okay. <laughs> Chuck Shaver. All right. Thank you. We'll see if I can uh, make up some more here. Um, so it, it is, is said, um, I'm uh, Chuck Schaefer, Chairman and CEO of Seacoast Bank. And uh, let's see, do we got slides by chance? There we go. Let's see, let's keep moving forward. Let me see if I can move this here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the economy and there's certainly a, a lot going on. And I'll start off with a bit of a conversation about Seacoast uh, and then jump into the, the uh, national economy and then talk probably a little more specifically about Florida. But uh, I, uh, I grew up in Florida. I was born in Melbourne, Florida. I've lived here my whole life. And uh, I've worked for Seacoast for 25 years and so been in the banking industry uh, are for quite some time now and, and lived through sort of multiple economic cycles and, and most recently COVID. So uh, I've seen a lot. We, um, we're one of the largest banks in the state of Florida that's focused just on the state of Florida. We're publicly traded under the ticker SBCF. Uh, we have a couple of pending transactions in South Florida that we're closing, but ultimately uh, we're about 15 billion. So maybe the 100th largest bank in the U.S. and primarily regional and, and focused on our, our great state. Um, talk a little bit, it's a little bit of history, but I won't go into that because we have limited time. But um, also uh, we have our marine lending team here, Lang Ryder and his team. Uh, they do an amazing job. Uh, we've been involved in... Um, both uh, trailer boat all the way up to uh, yacht lending uh, for many years. Uh, Lang's been in the business his whole career, and uh, we do loans from 50,000 up to 15 million. Uh, one of the larger South Florida uh, marine marine lenders, and the team does an incredible job, incredibly well versed in uh, collateral, and helping uh, borrowers navigate the uh, purchase process. Uh, so with that, uh, let me get a little bit into the economic outlook. So. I'm sure you guys are all seeing this in the grocery store and uh, it, it, it's a pump for a while, though that's come down, but, and then we've seen rents go up materially, but inflation has really taken hold in the U.S. You know, we originally coming out of COVID, the uh, thought was that inflation would be temporary uh, and what really turned out to be the case is it really wasn't temporary. And, and, and even though we've seen supply chain challenges uh, uh, come, come through and get better, Inflation still is stuck. And so, you know, I'll talk a little bit about why this happened and, and what the Fed's trying to do about it and what it, what it could do to the economy. But, you know, the Fed, in order to slow inflation, the Fed has to raise the uh, short end of the curve. So the overnight rate is which basically the rate that the Federal Reserve, which is kind of the bank of all banks in the U.S., borrows money from regional banks has raised rates uh, roughly to the overnight rate. If we invest funds with the, with the Fed, we'll get between 380 and 4% today. So it's, and then uh, basically if you look at Fed funds futures, which again, looking out in the futures market, it would say the short end of the curve um, will peak out around five, uh, right around 5%. And so the expectation right now on the forward curve is the Fed to do another 50 basis points uh, maybe 50 more beyond that in the first quarter and then stop and hold. Now, we've seen the, the jobs data. Uh, jobs data came out yesterday. And what's, what's interesting is, is this is a very unique period where historically, if you go back to the 08, 09 recession, that was largely driven by oversupply in the market. So too much building, too much supply in Florida you know, we, we, we dramatically were impacted by that oversupply. And so we had a lot of construction leading up to that, a lot of inventory coming on the market. Real estate values got very inflated. It was driven by spec leverage, a lot of people speculating in that market. And then you had this crashing uh, valuation that impacted all banks and really sent the U.S. into what was almost a, a Great Depression. So where we are today is a little bit different cycle. The Fed, instead of trying to kill the oversupply, which is what they did back 
in 08, 09. Now they're trying to slow demand. And so it's a very different cycle. And so you'll see that as we move through this. But importantly, and this is very small, but if you look at that red line over to the right, you see it kind of dive right at the end. What that red line is, is the 210 spread. So the US government borrows on the treasury curve, and they can borrow on different points of the curve. But the two-year part of the curve now is 80 basis points, or a little less than 1% higher than the long end of the curve. That is almost 100% predictive of a recession. The steeper that gets with the two-year uh, two moving up and the 10-year falling, the more likelihood of a recession is coming. And so when you look at this, it's pretty apparent we will have a recession in the coming year. I think uh, no matter who you talk to, no matter where you're at, small banks, big banks, economists, everybody believes there will be a recession uh, here probably on the back half of the coming year. Now the question is how deep and wide is that recession going to be? Most would believe that recession will be a mild recession. So again, we don't have a lot of overbuilding. And, and you'll see here in a bit, I, th I think Florida really does a lot better than most during that recession. But right now, the, the, the markets are predicting basically a bake-in of 100% probability of recession. Um, so what, what, this is, there's another sort of underlying piece of this that I really want to spend a little time with. So this, this line here, again, although small, that's the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. So you see over to the left, you see sort of that straight line all the way up until kind of the last financial crisis in 08. And then you see it start to speak, uh, spike up and build. If you ever heard, sort of listened to it, and during that period of time, you would hear this sort of component of quantitative easing, sort of up until uh, the last financial crisis, the Fed would primarily control the outcome of the economy by raising and lowering rates. Well, we added in the new tool in the last downturn, which was quantitative easing, which that meant they would go out and buy bonds off the market. The Treasury would print money. That printed money would flow into banks and allowed the, the Fed basically to be the investor into the US economy. And that's essentially how the Fed recovered after the great financial crisis, brought markets. Banks weren't lending at all. You know, you go back to 9, 10, 11, they didn't have the capital, they didn't have the ability. The Fed became the lender during that period of time. They did that by buying mortgage-backed securities off the market. But you see that Fed balance sheet, it was about one trillion, kind of going into the last financial crisis. It got as high as four trillion, and then it doubled again in COVID. And so this is, this is really a material uh, uh, component of what we're seeing today. So that we talked about inflation spiking up, right? Well, that increase in the Fed balance sheet is basically correlated 100% to why we had inflation. So what we did was when the pandemic hit, the government printed money, put that money in circulation, all bank balance sheets increased dramatically. The Fed basically increased their balance sheet and because basically all that money ended up flowing back to the Fed. And now you can see the Fed starting to peel off up in the upper right. So this is a really unique period where the Fed will be challenged to one, slow inflation by rising rates, but also control their balance sheet. That is a double impact to the economy. And so what's, what's interesting about it is normally when we'd go through this cycle, you'd start to see unemployment go up. What the challenge is for the Fed right now is a lot of labor force left the market during COVID. So as all this money got printed and pushed into the marketplace, and I don't have any charts on this, but if you looked at people over 55, many of them left the workforce because now they had this wealth effect that you know, I could retire and I don't longer need to work. So that a lot of them left and never came back. At the same time, the US government slowed immigration dramatically. And so you had just a lot less labor force that, to be available to the, to, the, to, the, to the marketplace. So the Fed is in this sort of unique position where they've got to slow down the economy, slow down demand. They'd like to see unemployment come up, but unemployment has become very sticky uh, because of the fact that there's, there's lack of labor in the workforce. And so depending on how fast, and this is the question, you know, is it a mild recession, is it a moderate recession, or is it a, you know, a dramatic recession? Most would believe it's a mild recession because they don't think unemployment's going to come up at the levels that it did, you know, if you go back to the financial crisis, 9, 10% unemployment, you know, maybe it goes up to 5 or 6% before the Fed gets their job done. But they need to create unemployment, and so we will, we will likely see higher unemployment. But this, this impact is, is fairly material. And this, this chart here, you can see, if you just look at that gray line in the back, and it's a little shaded, but right out to the right, you start to see it fall. This is actually liquidity in the banking system. So the banking system now is the Fed 
is starting to shrink their balance sheet, your banks, the Chase, uh, B of A, your local bank, Seacoast, all of us are seeing deposits basically flow away from us and that by we're just basically taking monetary supply back out of the market. What all that means is there's less money to lend, rates are going up, banks are tightening credit standards, and so you're gonna get this double effect as we move into the coming year of higher rates and less uh, supply in the marketplace. Now, how long that lasts, you know, it'll be up to the Fed as to how long they let that go on, but it will sort of materially flow through, through our economy. Um, now, the, the good news here is Florida is, is really on fire. You know, it's, it's doing much better than the rest of the country. Uh, Florida has now seen significant population migration. We've not had a lot of construction supply, so what I worry about as a banker in the state is how much construction we've done, how much supply is coming on market, because Florida has a boom-bust history because of the fact that we would always have oversupply. This cycle, because it's taken so long, there's not been a lot of supply, and to be honest with you, a lot of the supply that was put in the marketplace was d driven by private lenders, not banks. And so I think the banks are in really good shape going into this. I think Florida's banks are in really good shape, and our unemployment rate is much lower than, than the nation, and our population growth has been higher as well. You know, you can see this, that, t that green bar on the upper right, that's the amount of wealth that moved into Florida during the pandemic. The next bar down is Texas. So you can see Florida had this massive amount of wealth accumulation. This was compiled off of um, tax return data by the Wall Street Journal. So Florida like far exceeded anywhere else in the rest of the country. So what we see? We saw a lot of homes being bought with cash. We saw a lot of money being spent. We saw companies moving down. Yeah, we've seen even California coming to Florida first time. So Florida's in incredible shape and, and continues to be like in much better shape than many parts of the country. Um, the, the last thing, uh, there are a couple of comments on Florida. The, the housing market is, is normalizing, but generally it's still pretty healthy. If you look at time of inventory, but you can see you know, loans closed in cash. So almost 30% of all deals done in Florida, that's that yellow bar at the bottom, were done in cash in the state. Very unique period where all this cash was coming to Florida, but that's kind of starting to come down. And you can see medium sales price at the upper uh, right there. So home prices are starting to come down as well. This is happening nationwide. I think Florida has been a little more sticky than other markets, but we will start to see housing prices come down. Why? Because rates are so much higher. You know, and if you think about why did home mortgage rates go up in the sevens? Because the Fed stopped buying paper. When you go back to that Fed balance sheet, they decided they're not gonna buy uh, mortgages any longer, shrink their balance sheet. The market returned to normal. The cost to borrow went way up and now housing prices are starting to peel off. Um, you can see here, this is just new listings. So new listings have come down. This is the other sort of offset with Florida. There's still not a lot of inventory. So despite the fact that there's less buyers, there's still not a lot of supply. So that's allowed the market to balance. If unemployment goes up and people have to liquidate homes to create capacity because of the equity in the homes, you could then begin to see home prices fall even more dramatically. But that being said, I, I think any downside is probably fairly limited uh, as we move through this period. You know, we probably see home prices fall 10 to 20% over the next couple of years. Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, there's so much equity in housing in Florida. I think we're in, we're in great shape. Uh, month supply of inventory, you can see the, the lower right there. You can see the, the starting to see inventory come back on the market. This is the normalization. I wouldn't say this is more sellers. This is less buyers. So it's taking longer to get a home sold. Inventory is coming up. So it is normalizing, but probably something to be a little more healthy. You can see going back over a period of time to 2018, you know, we're still not even where we were pre-pandemic in terms of inventory. So a long way to go there. Um, so, and then the last thing I'll sort of mention and take any questions anybody has is, um, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but it um, sounds like we've got about 10 more minutes. Um, the uh, commercial real estate market remains very healthy as well. So if you look at commercial real estate around the state of Florida, um, there again, there hasn't been a lot of supply. There's been some, there's pockets of it. If you look at Orlando, you know, down into Miami, uh, there's been areas where there's certainly been new construction, but many parts of the state, there's limited available to bring new construction online. And so it's healthy. However, as the long end of the curve came, it come, has come up, although it's, it's starting to go back down now, um, that basically uh, the higher longer term rates get, the more impact it has on commercial real estate. And so cap rates are starting to come up a little bit, which devalues commercial real estate. That being said, again, 
I think Florida's in really healthy shape. I think we'll navigate what'll come better than most of the country. And uh, we're in really, really great position. But again, you know, if you're thinking about what's coming, what the big question mark that nobody can really ask, everybody believes is sort of mild recession, but the idea of moving from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening is a very big deal. And uh, if you think about all that, you know, even during COVID, how fast the, the stock market went up and equity markets went up, it was all the Fed. When you could borrow money at zero, everything worked. You know, you can't borrow money at zero anymore. You borrow money, depending on where you are on the curve, between let's call it four and 8% generally for a, a, a stronger borrower. But, you know, the cost of money has gone up fairly dramatically. Deals work less. The Fed is getting what it wants, would be the point, is they are slowing the economy. They will create some unemployment. And uh, they will get a recession, which is essentially their Fed's going to be okay with that. They're trying to make it, quote, unquote, a soft landing. The challenge will be how fast does liquidity flow out of the market. Uh, another example is Blackstone REIT over the weekend, a Wall Street Journal article. Uh, Asian borrowers were pulling money out of uh, that Blackstone REIT. Well, it's the first time we've seen sort of that since, since for a number of years. And the reason that's occurring is, again, it's all liquidity driven. The liquidity issue, which gets talked about, it doesn't get as much airtime as other things. There's just a liquidity coming out of the worldwide order to, to borrow money, harder for things to work. And that's essentially what the Fed's doing. We'll see how, how fast and how hard they move. I think they're trying to engineer a soft landing. I think Florida comes through this in pretty good shape, but we probably do see some sort of recession in, in the coming year. So with that, I'll, I'll close and, and see if there's any, uh, any questions I can take. So obviously not 93% of all statistics are made up. Sometimes 100% of the statistics <laughs> are correct. What questions do we have from the audience? So, hang on one second, I'll get over to you. How does that affect, with, for Florida and the U.S., our economy, how is it, because, um, I mean, our economy is connected with the world. Sure. So are other countries seeing the same type of things, especially coming off COVID, or are they doing better or worse than us? How is it going to impact us against them? Yeah, the best way to describe it is if you look at the dollar and the strength of the dollar going up, that gives you an indication most of the world's doing much worse. So inflation in Europe is actually higher than here. And uh, they're going all going through the same cycle where you're seeing central banks raise rates. Most of the world is, is probably going to do worse and will do worse through this period. And that's why you're seeing capital flow back to the U.S. and seeing the dollar strengthen. You know, we're the reserve currency of the world. When you see money flowing back, it's a risk off scenario where money's coming back to the US. Now, again, you know, we'll probably do better than most. Florida in our local market here is the biggest problem that can emerge is lack of inbound population growth. And so we've always lived on our pie always gets bigger, you know? And so everything's always chasing that expanding pie, if you will. And so when you have, like we had in 08, when you have like a shock to the system and population growth stops, problems emerge all over the place. Um, population growth doesn't seem to be slowing, even as all this is going on. I don't think population growth slows given low taxes, strong economy, very balanced government budget. That's not to be underappreciated. We run with a surplus, very different to the Northeast. And so, and the other issues driving people down here is crime. I mean, there's a lot of people moving even into South Florida to avoid crime in, in some of the larger northeastern and mid, midwestern cities. And so, I think it continues. I think population growth, that, that would be the biggest thing. If you wanted to look for where the problems would all of a sudden prop up for us is a population growth slow. Well, we, we'll continue to have good weather. <laughs> that drives people here. We have a very business-friendly environment with the current administration in the state of Florida, um, and it doesn't look like that's going to change any time in the real near future unless in 2024 the guy in the driver's seat decides he wants to have yeah. a little higher aspiration. Yeah. But we have a very business-friendly environment in the state of Florida. Uh, Chuck, one of the questions that I have for you is um, the – we talk about the way things are changing with the economy and, if, and inflation coming up and stuff. Do you see, at Seacoast specifically, do you see a change in the number of or the complexion of the buyers using lending, marine lending services? 
I, I, I spoke with Steve one time not too long ago, and uh, he mentioned to me that the business was still very active, but the complexion of the, of the, of the borrower was different. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, you know, maybe Lang, you want to take that? You, you probably do a better job answering that question. You're dealing with it day to day. You'd have a good insight as to what we're seeing. I'm not sure what Steve was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Just what's the complexion of the borrower today and how, how has volume changed for us and has it changed in the last few periods of time? Yeah, yeah what, I, what, I, what our conversation was I spoke about was um, the complexion. The last couple of years, I've said now we're going to have to go back to work. The last couple of years, our borrowers had a, had, had a credit score over 800. They didn't need the money, but they would borrow as long as rates stayed low. Now it's that complexion is changing. Those buyers are reverting back to cash buyers, cash positions, still in the marketplace, still buying boats, but not maybe necessarily making our phones ring as much. Yeah, yeah, and we're seeing that everywhere, right? And so if you can use cash, the cost of money has gone way up. They're using cash to get things done because it's just more expensive, you know. You look at home equity lending, mortgage lending, you know, the Fed raises rates, people move away from borrowing money. It just gets expensive. But interestingly enough, our entire industry is discretionary spending. It's after tax dollars. Nobody needs a boat. Everybody needs a house. Nobody yep. needs a boat. Even if you live on an island, right. you don't need a boat. But lo and behold, everybody's still cranking. Yep. And that's it's it's amazing how, you know, you look at the you look at the evening news and they want to paint a picture of doom and gloom and we come to our offices and we got more to do than we can say grace over in a day. Yep. So we're really blessed that it's working out well for us. Any other questions from the audience? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's an awesome segment. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I'm impressed with the information that's flowing today. That was fantastic. Thanks, Chuck. Um, aren't we lucky to be working in the uh, yachting and boating and ancillary support service businesses? We are so lucky. Our clients, are, are, we are so resilient and so resistant. The charter market is booming right now. Um, and as we say, as you hear me say every time we have a seminar, 78% of those people who buy or build a yacht have chartered at least once. But your company, if they're not involved in chartering in one way or another, you should get out there and do that. All right, you're lucky. I'm going to send you on a break. You're right on time. Don't forget your pink sheets. Also, you can um, QR scan, put your comments in there, and be back in 15 minutes.